Dennis Prager here. Thanks for listening to the Daily Dennis Prager Podcast. To hear the entire three hours of my radio show, commercial-free, every single day, become a member of PragerTopia. You'll also get access to 15 years' worth of archives, as well as the daily show prep. Subscribe at PragerTopia.com. Hi, everybody. Dennis Prager here. And a personal announcement, my last show for two weeks, my one two-week vacation of the, of the year, a cruise with listeners. And I'm flying to Eastern Europe today after the show. I broadcast essentially till the last minute. <laughs> and the people who sit in for me are spectacular. So I, I know you're in really good hands, and I would advise those of you uh, who are thinking of cruising with me next year, when you hear the announcements that I will make on uh, the radio, you should uh, register as soon as possible, because they do sell out. And life goes by very quickly, my dear friends. A highlight... And for some, the highlight of the tr cruises with me is the people you will meet. I am always amazed at the number of people who don't have close friends. I told you about the man I had. I had a couple. A couple that I had. A young couple. My wife and I had a lunch with a, a couple of months ago. Tremendous uh, quality couple in Hollywood. And there is not a single couple in their lives who know that they are conservative. And yet, of course, they call these people friends. And I'm happy that they do. I want them to have friends. That's my point. But I don't know what a friend is if you have to hide who you are. I mean, what you believe about society and about life and about good and evil are, are not incidental. If they don't know your hobby, you know, is putting uh, Legos together, that's, that's not a bad thing. It's, it's irrelevant. I mean, it's still good to tell people, but it's not important but not to know your value system because you're afraid you will lose them as friends. Anyway, so for reasons that elude me, parents still take their children to Disney World and Disneyland. There is a concept in, in Judaism called Chilul Hashem desecration of the name and in effect it's the worst sin you could commit it is when you take God's name and do evil or do what God does not want in God's name it's a really 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 bad sin so if you were to uh, hold up a bank while wearing a yarmulke that would be an example I guess somewhat of an absurd example since it's not likely to happen, but that that would be a stark example of Chilul Hashem, desecration of the name or desecration of God's name. So that concept of Chilul, of desecration of anything, has played an important role in my life. There was a man as a professor at the University of London who just wrote a book. It's coming out in January. I don't, I don't know. I guess they delayed it. And The Economist reviewed it and noted that this historian of the Holocaust, major historian of the Holocaust, mentioned in it that uh, Republicans are fascists. <laughs> so I, I thought the concept of Chilul HaShoah, of desecration of the Holocaust, to use the Hebrew word for it that is increasingly used, Shoah, so here's one, Chilul Disney, desecration of Disney. Disney was, for most of its existence, regarded as 
if you will, to use a woke term, a safe, a safe place for young people, for kids. It was a place to exercise their imagination, to smile and to laugh. It was, shall we use a term that is never used any longer, wholesome. Disney was known for wholesome fun. Disneyland video shows male employee dressed in drag and greeting children. Yeah, guy has a mustache and he's wearing women's clothing. So they go out of their way to desecrate the holy at uh, Disneyland. Isn't this what you want your kid to see? A guy with a mustache wearing a dress? I don't think it is. And yet, why do people continue to take their children there? want you to know that it is quite possible to have a rich childhood without having visited Disneyland. Eventually they would get the message if enough people did not go, just like Anheuser-Busch got the message. Maybe Target is now getting the message. These companies are creating two Americas. The America that wishes to destroy everything that has undergirded Western civilization, including its most significant distinction aside from good and evil, and that is male and female. Why they wish to obliterate such a wonderful distinction, something that is so bloodily, <laughs> bloody enriching of one's life, only God knows. TikTok video, this is from Breitbart, a TikTok video that appears to show a male Disneyland employee dressed in drag and greeting children has gone viral, attracting millions of views since being posted earlier this week. The video shows a man who calls himself Nick. So this is not a trans person. This is what we used to call a cross-dresser. A man who calls himself Nick, welcoming children to the Bibbidi Bobbidi Boutique at Disneyland in Anaheim, California. The Bibbidi Bobbidi Boutique allows young girls to live out their fantasies by glamming them up as Disney princesses. I am stunned that they still allow that. Wow. Imagine you're a princess to a girl? Hmm. In the video, the mustachioed Nick identifies himself as Fairy Godmother's Apprentice while wearing a dress and what appears to be heavy women's makeup. That's right. That's what girls first see when they go in there. Are, are, is everybody comfortable with it? The TikTok video has been reposted to Twitter, where it has garnered more than 4.2 million views so far. As Breitbart News reported, Disney decided last year to make its Bibbidi Bobbidi Boutique at Disney World in Orlando and Disneyland in Anaheim more gender inclusive by rebranding its stylists from fairy godmothers in training to fairy godmothers apprentices. Well, I, it's a subtle difference. They're not godmothers in training. They're not fairy godmothers in training because they're not making fairy godmothers because Nick is not a mother. Get that? That That is my exegesis on the term, on the change. The Walt Disney Company has been working to make its parks more gender neutral in recent years. One of the biggest changes was the elimination of Disney's iconic reading, Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, now Disney Park addresses guests as dreamers of all ages. They no longer welcome, as I reported to you. This is already many years. Years ago, I reported, I remember, with South Carolina, where a classroom... Well, the classroom teacher was told no longer to say boys and girls. That is now commonplace in schools in America. 
where teachers don't say, okay, boys and girls, open up your books too, or whatever it might be. And I remember when the London Tube eliminated ladies and gentlemen to passengers. Now, do you think society is better for that? That's my, uh, my question to you. Last year, the company opened gender-neutral restrooms in its parks. By the way, if the men's room or ladies' room is full, you should definitely use the gender-neutral room. I have done that on a number of occasions when the men's room was, was filled. 1A Prager 776. You're listening to The Dennis Prager Show. <laughs> Many novice gold and silver buyers make fatal mistakes when buying precious metals for the first time. Mistakes made because of dealer gimmicks and scams. Dennis Prager here for Amfed Coin and Bullion. My choice and it really is, for buying precious metals. Numerous precious metal dealers are capitalizing on the demand for gold by selling inexperienced investors collectible coins with outrageous markups. One company charges as much as $18,000 for collectible coins that are only worth about $5,500 in the open market. It's an example of the honesty of AmFed. Other dealers tell falsehoods about government gold confiscation or regulation of gold prices at AmFed Coin and Bullion. They keep things simple and transparent so you'll Understand what you own and its true value. If you're thinking of buying or have already purchased and want a second opinion, call Nick Grovich, the man I trust, and his team at Amfed Coin and Bullion, 800-221-7694. Receive a complimentary coin performance review, AmericanFederal.com, AmericanFederal.com. I call on you, my friend. So if this stuff bothers you, that uh, little girls and boys, especially little girls in this case, are greeted by a man with a mustache wearing a dress at Disneyland. There are many things you can do in addition to not going to Disneyland. That would be the best. But you can join organizations that fight for the values we stand for. Anonymous in Glendale, Arizona. Hello. Yes, sir. So my, my cousin works at the park, and she had made a comment to me, and he said, I just wanted to pass this on to you. That that there uh, evidently there there has been talks amongst customers who go to the park, but that um, they're, they're reluctant to go to HR or to the to the um, executives and make complaints because these these families spend so much money and I, I know this uh, not only to get in the park but if you're coming from like Miami you're paying for a, a hotels you're paying for flights. So you're paying thousands of dollars, and then you get to the park, and then you see, wow, there's a man playing the fairy godmother, right? So most people ordinarily, under most circumstances, would complain, hey, what's going on? But because my cousin thinks that there's sort of a culture of fear there, that people won't even complain because they're afraid of being labeled a hater, a bigot, whatever you want to be called. So out of fear of pretty much any sort of retaliation, you just don't say anything. And so I I imagine that she has heard from other employees and maybe disgruntled people just walking around the park talking amongst each other saying you know what's going on but that this for, for whatever reason they're reluctant to go to to the hr and the, the executives at the park and so that, as what she says is she can't think of any other reason why this would be other than people are afraid because you just spent five thousand right. dollars so, your whole so what no no but the question i'm posing is why are they going to begin with I think I, 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 this is so. This is from this is me reading between the lines here from my cousin. Is I just think there's a whole lot of America that really doesn't know what the heck is going on, Mister Prager, and I hate to say that. Okay, you're right. A that's a, a that, that's right. That's a there. very very important point. I thank you for your call. That, <laughs> that is exactly correct. See, ignorance is a sin. When bad things are happening, ignorance is willful. If you don't know what Disney is doing to everything associated with children, whether it's its films or its parks, you have decided to tune out. 
and let others fight. Okay? It's wrong. It's it's simple as that. It's an interesting question that I'm posing right now in my mind because I don't like pulpits being politicized. The left has done that and has ruined many synagogues and churches. However, if there is something that is so egregious in its opposition to basic principles of the Jewish and Christian faiths, shouldn't rabbis, priests, and ministers speak out? Shouldn't they say, don't go to to the Disneyland uh, or Disney World worlds? I remind people that there is a law in Deuteronomy. Now you can say it's irrelevant to you. You can say it's wrong. You know, what did Moses know that I don't know? You think you think I'm going to listen to that? Or God, if you believe that there's a divine origin, as I do, to the first five books of the Bible? And the law says a man shall not wear women's clothing. It is fundamental to the biblical outlook on life, which I think is actually wiser than Disneyland or Harvard. And that is that God made two sexes, period, end of issue, full stop. And it is very important to maintain that. So he mentioned, it's it's very interesting, he mentioned that people fear being called haters. So they won't say anything at, at Disneyland. Then that's true, they fear that. The left, that's the left's greatest weapon, the smear, the lie, the libel. So here's one. This is from the University of Dayton and the government. That, that's a very uh, important thing that you understand. Uh, that uh, they, the Department of uh, Home Security has issued uh, or has helped fund the issuance of a pyramid showing Nazis at the top and, well, not actually Nazis in the, in the second realm to the top. The, the, the folks on the top are, are not um, are white supremacist organizations. I don't know why the Nazis are not included. Right below Nazi, there are four levels. Right below Nazi in this pyramid is Breitbart, PragerU, Turning Point, and let's see, is that, uh, what else can I, uh, can, I don't know all the symbols here, but those are, those are some of them. So it's, it's fascinating. PragerU is listed uh, with Department of Homeland Security support uh, at the, uh, a university from U- University of uh, Cincinnati presented a pyramid. Oh, per Christian Broadcasting Network, American Conservative Union, Quillette, and these are right below Nazis. You can see it if you're watching the show. You can see a picture of this pyramid. This was a grant proposal from the Homeland Security Program. Hmm. This seminar was not funded, organized, or hosted by the Department of Homeland Security. A spokesperson for the agency told the New York Post, which is where I'm reading to you from. Dan Schneider, a vice president at MRC, said the Department of Homeland Security is lying through its teeth once again. Smear is their weapon. Just when you thought it couldn't get any better, Mike Lindell with my pillow is launching the My Pillow 2.0. When Mike invented My Pillow, it had everything you could ever want in a pillow. Now, nearly 20 years later, he discovered a new technology that makes it even better. The My Pillow 2.0 has the patented adjustable fill of the original My Pillow, and now with a brand new fabric that is made with a temperature regulating thread. The My Pillow 2.0 is the softest, smoothest, and coolest pillow 
you'll ever own. For my listeners, the MyPillow 2.0 is buy one, get one free offer with promo code Prager. MyPillow 2.0 temperature regulating technology is 100% made in the USA and comes with a 10-year warranty and a 60-day money-back guarantee. Just go to MyPillow.com and click on the radio listeners square to the buy one, get one free offer. Enter promo code Prager or call 800-761-6302 to get your MyPillow 2.0 now. Hi, everybody. I'm Dennis Prager, and I opened up by reporting to you that they now have a man with a mustache to make sure you know he's a man, and there's no, he doesn't claim to be a woman, but he is a fairy godmother assistant, as called greeting little kids, mostly girls, as they enter one of the exhibits at the park, and... This cross-dressing male is a is a symbol of what Disney is doing to ruin the society. It's nobody ten years ago would have believed this if somebody would have predicted this. They would have laughed at it. Men, I'm not talking transgender cisgender, as the left uses the term, cisgender men wearing women's clothing were called cross-dressers. It it was deemed something that you would not do in public because the public erasure of male-female difference was regarded as, how shall we put it, problematic for society. But there is no concept of what is good for society. The only concept is, how do you feel about it personally? Another anonymous, for reasons I don't know, but it's okay with me. Your name is virtually as anonymous as the word anonymous. Santa Monica, California, hello. Hi, Dennis. Thank you so much for taking my call. I just wanted to tell me that you, I won't tell you, you described my best friend, her family escaped uh, Nazi captivity. She fled to this country, had a relative here. She will not now recognize she is a Democrat, denies when I tell her the facts such as you report, and is doing the same denial that her, let's say her, her elder family did in Germany. So I don't understand people like that. I, you know, it it bothers. I'm so concerned, but she's a very loyal Democrat. And um, there was nothing the Democrats could do that would have her uh, 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 vote not uh, otherwise. There is nothing. That's it. Left does the damage, and the liberals vote them in. Conservatives vote their values, the left vote their values, liberals don't vote their values. Liberals are the most emotionally uh, dominated group of all three. I feel that the Republicans are bad, so I vote for the Democrats, and I refuse to know how much bad they're doing. Look, the human species is not impressive. What can I tell you? There are impressive humans, but the species is not impressive. Cowardice is is dominant. Courage is rare. E- even even the willingness to pursue truth is rare in human beings, like in your friend that you just described. I wish I had preserved this letter. I got I got an email f- from someone who just ripped into me which has no effect on me but ripped into me saying that I lie when I say that kids at college are taught that all whites are racist is an example of of a person for whom truth is a joke the idea of pursuing truth is not is not meaningful you the only thing that liberals know is fight the right That's all they know. 
Many of them are fine individual human beings, good fathers, mothers, friends, loyal, you, you name it. But when it comes to the society, they have decided to become fools. They're guided by one principle, fight conservatism. Therefore, what the left does to damage every liberal principle is of zero consequence, and as she pointed out, they don't want to know. That's the biggest sin. They don't want to know. Does this woman want her granddaughters to be greeted by a man in a dress? Does she not care? At least let her answer that question. Hi, everybody. Dennis Prager, male, female hour. Every Wednesday, one of the most wonderful responses I get to me when people meet me is when a couple comes over and both or one of them say that the male-female hour has tremendously helped their marriage. That's, that's what I'm hoping for. As I explain every week, I think it's the most honest talk about men and women in the media. If I'm wrong, uh, actually, if I'm wrong, I'm happy. To, to think that there's even more honest talk does not, would not bother me. I'm not in competition I want to do good, and I want to do good with this hour. So I take on topics on occasion that are painful and that people prefer not to address. Today will be such an example. Last hour, I addressed this issue of things people don't want to address tangentially, but it became an important part of the hour. How many people don't want to know what is going on in society? They don't want to know what Disneyland and Disney World are doing, for example. People avoid troubling information. And so I'm applying that to men and women in particular, and I I have touched upon this in the past, but not for a while. And it is worth revisiting because it's so important So if I may be personal, because the person I know best is talking to you, and I have often in my life used me to understand others because I'm no different from others. I have the same impulses, I have the same nature, I'm a human. Now we all have our own individual nature, that's true but we all also share human nature. So I remember I didn't marry till I was 32 years old. And I will tell you an anecdote that had made a very big impression upon me in my 20s. I played racquetball regularly, and I had a racquetball partner the guy I I most often played with, he too was in his 20s, and he had just gotten married. And I had dinner with him and his wife. All of us were in our 20s, late 20s, I would imagine. So we were talking about our, we were talking to his wife, his his new bride, about our time together playing racquetball each week. And I mentioned that after each game, we would step outside the court and in the corridor there, you you know, rest on a bench, dry ourselves off with a towel, and look at the women who passed by. I met, that's basically what I said. And she said, well, and I'll make up a name. Tom doesn't. And then he kicked me under the table. One of the most eloquent kicks 
I have ever received. His wife did not believe he was checking out other women. And of course, I knew he was because he was a heterosexual male. Had he been a homosexual male, he'd have been checking out the men. The visual has a tremendous impact on males. And what was most important was that she was in denial that he was checking out other women and that he wanted me to agree with her that he doesn't, hence the kick under the table. So I I made a vow to myself that I would not marry a woman from whom I had to hide my sexual nature as a man. And I now, many, many years later, this is many decades later, that kick under the table is a metaphor for what goes on, I suspect, in most marriages, at least in our society. I can't speak for marriages in Bangladesh, but in in the United States, I suspect that most men hide their sexual nature from their wives. It goes to an even deeper discussion, how many men fear women, which is not a good thing for men, not a good thing for women, not a good thing for marriage, not a good thing for society. It is not, it, again, both of these subjects are almost never discussed. Fear of women's rage uh, is a major factor in male behavior. It is a major factor in the drift toward wokeness in the United States, which is uh, disproportionately led by women, and men do not want women's rage. That is worthy of its own subject, incidentally. Now, by the way, there are women who fear their husbands, rage, and that's horrible. Rage, as a general rule, in a marriage is a bad thing. But my topic here is not the rage one. It is the kick under the table. Shut up and don't describe yourself. I have, I have touched upon this in the course of, I don't know, 15 or 20 years of doing the male-female hour, and this has helped a lot of marriages. I think every woman should say to her husband, should tell her husband the anecdote that I, that I mentioned, and say, do you, do you hide, honey, do you hide your sexual nature from me? because you're afraid it will be painful to me to hear. And by the way, I acknowledge, when women first learn about male sexual nature, it it does, in fact, bother them sometimes a great deal, sometimes frightens them. It shouldn't. A good man is in control of his nature. I'm not talking about men acting upon their nature. I don't defend that. I'm talking about men and their nature. The fact that he did not want his bride to know that he was checking out women, that's what men do. Is it wrong? There are certain people for for religious reasons who believe that is wrong, and I, I respect that. I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about non-religion. I'm talking about male nature. A uh, a man of uh, in his late 30s we were discussing this around a Shabbat table Sabbath table Friday night I get together with 
about a dozen people every Friday night and did the entire lockdown period. It was a lifesaver. He's not particularly religious, but he's a spectacular human being. And uh, we discuss, we were discussing this issue, and he put it in a very interesting way. He said, with regard to male sexuality, women are visitors, men are prisoners. This is a very intelligent line. This is the battle men have to fight. Women have to fight the battle of emotions. Men have to fight the battle of their sexual nature. As you, have you and your husband talked about this? One eight Prager seven seven six. I've been getting used to waking up with you. I'm Dennis Prager. This is the male female hour. All right, this is a real honest male female hour. That anecdote is so important about the kick under the table from my friend in, who didn't want me to acknowledge to his wife that he checked out the women at the gym. And he, he, he I, to the, I, I, I can't know the intimate lives of anyone, but my suspicion is that he was as faithful as, as husbands come. And certainly he was a new, new husband in any event. He was a good man. Uh, let's go to Sacramento, California, and Mark. Hello. Hey, Dennis. Hi. First, your your call screener laughed at me. I was so embarrassed. <laughs> she, I can't believe it. She laughed with you, I suspect, not at you. No, I was in pain, and she laughed at me. Uh-huh. I uh, believe me, it was sympathetic. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, my theory on it is that, well, for one thing, she asked me, want me to make a point that I do hide it. And, um, well, my theory on it is that is the cause of many problems. The, the, the hiding is not real. You can't hide anything. You can only suppress it. You deny it. You go along with the denial the woman demands. And you deny your own sexuality, which leads to a loss of drive. And are actually seeing it right now, and a loss of testosterone and certain counts in the male body. And it has real consequences. What is the it? I'm sorry. What has real consequences? The denial? The, the, the silencing? What? The, the, the denial. Even though the man knows, you know, he still looks or whatever. He still has that desire to look. But in her presence, he'll make sure he never does. So he's he's suppressing his natural I see. tendency. I, Not that a man should lust openly in front of his wife, but right. if he looks, he looks, and a woman should understand that. But that that going along with it, her denial, I believe, has led to a loss of drive in men. That's fascinating. I had never c- contemplated that. What are the consequences in that way? I don't know that. I don't know. If that's true, I don't know that it's not true, but it might—it might well be. Look, I—it's—it's I, it's like in the political realm. I told the story last hour of the couple that my wife and I had lunch with a few months ago. Wonderful two people, in in their th- I think in their thirties, and. They're in Hollywood, and he, he's pretty successful in, in in Hollywood. And in any event, he mentioned, I asked, I always ask people, do you have close friends? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, we have a number of couples we're close with, but none of them know we're conservative. So let me ask you something. If you acknowledge that that is not a real relationship where they suppress from friends that they are conservative, they suppress expressing their values, then why is it not injurious to a relationship if men suppress their speaking about their nature? They have to suppress acting on it. I expect men to be faithful and loving. That's That to me is a given. But to suppress what your nature is like 
why is that any different from suppressing that you're a conservative? And why do people suppress they're a conservative? Because they're afraid that it will alienate those friends. Men are afraid it will alienate their wives, or worse, they'll get angry at them. Or the men will feel shame. God made our natures, ladies and gentlemen. There is nothing to be ashamed about with regard to your nature. The only thing you should be ashamed about, in my view, is your behavior. I can't tell you how liberating that is for a life, where you are forthright to yourself and to your wife about your nature, but you don't act upon it when it is wrong. End of issue. That is a good way, in my opinion, to lead one's life. Female sexual nature is not male sexual nature. It isn't even close. It's not better, it's not worse, it's just utterly different. Women have other battles to wage against their nature. This is not one of them. This is men's battle. Why do I raise this? Because there's a lot of mockery of me on the internet for raising this, because there are people who uh, literally are scared of truth. They are scared of it. I do this in order to help you. I have no other agenda. If it's bad to hide your convictions, then it's bad to hide your nature. Okay, uh, Mary in San Antonio, Texas. Hello. Hi, Dennis. Hi. What I uh, learned early in my relationship with my husband, we've been married 21 years now, both our second marriage, is um, during um, sex he would talk, you know, some like some of his dreams out. And when we first got together, I thought, that's kind of weird. But I realized what you were saying when he woke up in the morning or the next day, he was normal. You know, I mean, everything was, he was a good man, but sometime, you know, but at night or during sex, he would have these fantasies. And at first as a woman, it was kind of weird to get used to that. But now I know it's more just for his arousal type stuff. So I think it's something I just learned, uh, you know, as I age. You're a quality woman. I, I salute you. That's why I have another motto that uh, bothers some people. I don't know why. I do know why, actually. It's a separate issue. But I have said this for much of my life. You have sex in the bedroom and you make love outside the bedroom. In other words, be loving all the time. But the bedroom is time for Sometimes just loving and sometimes just sex. Down on the corner by the traffic light, everybody's looking as she goes by. They turn their heads and they watch her till she's gone. Lord have mercy, baby's got her blue jeans on. By the bus stop and across the street, open up their windows to take a peek. Hello, everybody. I'm Dennis Prager. This is the Male Female Hour, every Wednesday, the second hour of the show. And I want to note to you that today we'll be flying to Poland. And I will be joining with your fellow listeners on a Dennis Prager listener cruise for the next two weeks. I'm taking off the one, the one two-week period I take off each year, have for 25 years except for the lockdowns. I would have gone on a cruise every year during the lockdowns, but there were no ships to do so. Anyway, I just wanted to explain there will be terrific people sitting in. Today's subject is one that almost nobody discusses, let alone in the media, male sexual nature, and do men hide it from their wives? And the answer is, I would say, most men do. 
And it's not a good thing in general. There are exceptions, of course. But it is, in general, it is not a good thing because what the more you hide from a person who is close to you, the less close you are to them. And but, but that's definitional. And why do people hide things from others? Not just in the sexual realm. Their politics, for example, because they're afraid of the reaction that they will receive. And that's not good either. All right, Denver, Colorado, and Jack. Hello, Jack. Thanks for uh, taking my call. I have the most uh, jealous woman on the planet. She will watch my eyes in the checkout stand to see if I'm looking at magazines that might possibly have a woman on them. Did you know this when you were dating? No, it crept up. I've been with her for eight years, nine, going on nine. And it just kind of crept up. And a friend of mine told me it's only going to get worse, and I didn't listen to him. Oh, you, he told this to you before you were married? Yeah. 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 Well, that, that's another subject because nothing changes when people get married so people should never depend on somebody changing if there's some if there's a problematic arena uh look obviously i wanted to to work out i I wish that she could speak to a trusted ideally woman and to explain to her that this is your nature you're not doing it to hurt her you're still completely faithful to her and you love her and one has nothing to do with the other uh it's uh you know, I'll give you an interesting uh, Jewish example. So uh, Jews who are obedient to Jewish law don't eat bacon or pork, uh, for example. Uh, and the greatest Jewish thinker who ever lived, Maimonides, said that the one should not say, oh, uh, pork is disgusting. One should say, oh, it's delicious, but because God doesn't want me uh, to eat it, I won't eat it. So it, 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 there's a parallel here. Yes, other women are "quote unquote" delicious, uh, uh, but I will I will never partake of any of them, honey. You are my one woman. But uh, uh, you're you're asking me to smell bacon and think, oh, it, it, I don't like it. Now you can't say that probably, given the nature of your wife. Uh, but uh, I wish I could talk. She needs to be reassured. That your oh. nature will not will will not lead you to stray, and have completely done that. In fact, one day we were in the truck together, and you were on the radio, and her first exposure to you of all things it just happened to be the radio show that you were talking about women with oversized yeah. breasts that needed to you know have them reduced for medical reasons, and so therefore. Uh, her first, first exposure to listening to that's you. That's a riot. That, that's really funny, <laughs> yeah, i got to say. Was really not, it was really not funny. <laughs> yeah, it's not a typical show. <laughs> exactly. Not at all. Not in the least. So I, I would love for her to call in and have a conversation. Yes, with that's you. right. Yes. Uh, well, and, that's yeah, I'll tell you what might help. I have a video up at PragerU. It's actually, ironically, I have 55 videos up there, but that's one out of ten. Uh, Nine-tenths are done by others. And it's called, the title is, He Wants You. It's five minutes. I, I would strongly suggest you show it to her. It, in some ways, it's the video I'm most proud of. He Wants You at PragerU.com. Pretty woman walking down the street. Pretty woman, the kind I like to meet. Pretty woman, I know. Hi, everybody. Dennis Prager here. Male, female hour. How many men hide their sexual nature from their wives? I would say more than half. I have no study to document it because they I don't think they've done a study on this. However, I may have something better than a study. I've actually talked to so many people on the radio and 
at speeches and at get-togethers and so on over the course of a lifetime. Anyway, whatever the number, it's widespread. Hence, I told you the anecdote of my friend in my 20s who had just been married and when I mentioned that he and I checked out the women at the gym after during, between racquetball games, he kicked me under the table after his uh, wife had said, oh, Tom doesn't do that. And I thought, oh, that's so sad. It's scary to a woman in the beginning. I fully get that. And that is one of the reasons that a man has to keep reassuring his wife about how she is the love of his life. And therefore, he wants her to know everything about him. She might even start to get a kick out of it. It could be a fun thing. One of the reasons I talk so openly about this is my father, my late father, whom people uh, sort of fell in love with because I had him on, on his birthday, July 18th, every year for for many years on my radio show. My dad was completely open about his sexual nature, and he was uh, in love with his wife, my mother, for 73 years. How's that? How many women would be happy to have that trade? A guy who's open about his sexual nature and who remains a loving husband for 69 years and together for 73. Maybe those two facts are related. Maybe they're not. My dad used to say, to give you an example, he said, at my funeral, I would appreciate if you would leave the couple of inches open uh, in the coffin so I could check out the women in the front row. How's that? That's the way I was raised, and that's why I can talk to you like this. Okay, Dina in what? Chicagoland? That's hilarious. Is that what you told the screener? You're in Chicagoland? I am in, in the suburbs of Chicago. Which one? In Palatine. Excellent. Thank you for calling. Go ahead. What's on your okay. mind? Okay. Yep. So it, exactly what you were just talking about, it's funny because my my parents before my father passed away, we're together for 60 years. Mm -hmm. And as a, a, a young girl, my father always was very flirtatious, but in a complimentary way to women always. And my mother would be right there when he would do it, like complimenting people, uh, women, you know, or dancing when we would be out at a wedding or something with other women. And I had a sister-in-law that was really offended by it. And I said, what are you offended by? He appreciates women. He loves my mother. And when he would see my mom, his eyes would light up for my mother. And we knew as kids growing up that my parents were together forever and there was no uh, cheating or anything like that. But my father was just a gregarious man and people loved his personality. And it was part of him to appreciate women's physiques and compliment them in front of us and my mother and my mother knew that he was always loyal to her well that's fascinating it, it's fascinating f for for the obvious reasons my own reaction is is a drop ambivalent but I, it'll work then i have i have no ambivalence about that at all sound like a terrific couple uh i if if i saw my dad dancing with another woman at, at an event, I, I think I'd feel funny. Uh, but, you know, people work out what they work out in their own ways, and I'm, I'm not judging him in the least. I'm only speaking about how my own internal reaction might be. I, I am a behaviorist, period, end of issue. I care how you act. I don't care how you think number of people who mean well and do bad is as large as the people who have sinful thoughts and act good. So I, uh, I admit it. 
and obviously many, many people differ with me. I love a lot of these people, and that's the way it is. There are different approaches to life. I'm a behaviorist. I care how you act. Okay, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Whoa, all right, well, that's a toughie. Anonymous in Dallas's wife had been raped, so he has to be very careful about it. I, I, I understand that. Oh, good. Sandy in Columbus, Ohio. Thank you for calling. Hello. Hi. Hi, I'm a big fan. I, this is kind of like the only issue I disagree with you. I think everything else you do is wonderful. Thank <laughs> but you. this is, I think there's some things to be added here. Um, I called in and said that um, lusting after other people is a form of betrayal. And um, I, I actually think that that is probably the reason that people are not getting married and having children today. I think women have been betrayed too much. And this lusting thing gets you too close where you never know if your husband's going across the line or not. I think, Dennis, that if you were... Are, are, forgive me, woman, are, you, are you married? Yes. A- and you you feel your fa- your husband does not look? Well, he does. I think it depends what you do with the information, which I'll get to. And it actually connects to your video, uh, He Wants You, which I watched. Wh- which you watched. Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. I did, yeah. Um, so well, let's, I guess we'll get right to that. Um, well, I was going to say that you would never tolerate this kind of betrayal if you were a woman, but you can think about that. Um, in your well, video, no, I don't know that. Things... I don't think my wife thinks or, or, or a lot of these people calling in think that it is a betrayal uh, because I'm so well, I, loyal I... and loving. Well, I'm, stay on, stay on. I got a break, but I'm not letting you go. Hello, everybody. Dennis Prager. Very important male-female hour on men's sexual nature. And are they honest about it? And I thank Sandy tremendously for calling in because she feels that there's an element of betrayal, for example, when men look at uh, uh, other women. So I don't remember where we were, but you're still on. Oh, yes. I said to you that what matters is, is your husband loyal, faithful, and loving? Where where his uh, uh, sexual nature and mind wander should not trouble you. You're not being betrayed if he does nothing with it. Well, let me. Can I go back to your to your little he wants you video? Sure. Um. So I tried to figure out what struck me as not quite right about that video. In general, it was fine, but there was something irking me, and I figured out what it is. Uh-huh. You know, and you and in the video, it was like you know when you see someone attractive, you're drooling, and you're like so. Turned well, on. I but didn't. No, no, you 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 yeah. added drooling. I didn't. Okay. Uh, I think the video. If, if the man is drooling, drooling <laughs> it's not a good sign. <laughs> I just want to make that clear. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, that as soon as you're out of their presence, you forget about them completely. That's so, right. That's important. I, yeah, and I understand that. And I also understand and respect that this is men's nature, and they can't, they have no control over it even if they wanted to. And I think, and I think that the, um, the thing for me that would make me feel better about that video that was missing for me is if, because like, let's say you have a beautiful secretary, well, and you see her every day, then you're, you're, you're screwed. Like, you're going to end up having an affair with her. There's no question. Um, oh, you know, I think I think there is a question. Pregnant. I don't agree with you on that. Uh, it, okay. It's like it's like uh, a chambermaid who sees cash every day. Will she end up stealing? Right. You have to be highly principled. Well, okay, so you should marry a highly to... principled husband. You probably did. Okay. 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 So in the video, if I think what would make me feel better is say when you see someone really attractive in real life that grabs your eyes and like you're you're kind of whatever momentarily hypnotized if you can talk yourself out of it right then and there in their presence then you're good if you can say to yourself yeah she's really she's really gorgeous in this and that way it doesn't matter and i i can tell my wife about it we can laugh about it and but my wife under but i can also look away from her i can put up that boundary because i value something much much more and what and what is it that way and what is that what is the it Either my wife or just myself. Right, but you value your wife. Okay, I I hear you. I wish we had more time. You value your wife 
through your behavior. That's why I'm a big advocate of men talking to their wives and telling them how much they love them and ideally how attracted they are to them. Well, I wish I could take all your calls. I really do. I learn a lot from you, and I hope it's comparable from me. We continue. Hey, everybody. Dennis Prager here. It's my final hour before my annual two-week vacation, which is not entirely vacation because it's a listener cruise, and I speak frequently on the ship. And I'm headed to Eastern Europe today, right after the show. In light of that, I'm just going to open the lines as if it were Friday, the third hour. Whatever is on your mind. Okay, whatever is on your mind hour, as if it were Friday, 18 Prager 776 877 Headed to fascinating places, Hungary and Croatia and Bulgaria and Romania, giving a speech in Bucharest. So wonderful, wonderful places to visit, starting in Poland. That's the pre-cruise. Do you know that I have not been to Poland since it was communist? So when did the, the, the wall fell, what, 1989? And I was there actually in my 20s, in the 70s. When I will meet Poles and tell them when I was last there, it would be like somebody visiting the United States and saying, oh yeah, I, I was uh, I was in your country during the Vietnam War. <laughs> and for many people, that it's, it's not even a memory. Either they weren't born or they were too young. I am extremely curious to see these, these countries. I had not been to Bulgaria since it was communist. I've been to both Romania and Hungary a number of times, but not not there. I I think about King Solomon's ring a lot. King Solomon, the story goes, it's a legend, but it's a great story. Said to his wise men, notice by the way that leaders used to have wise men. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty important to have wise people around you. Anyway, he asked his wise men, I'd like you to make me a magic ring, something that will uplift me when I'm down and something that will bring me back to earth when I get a little too high. Not not on drugs, but you know, in terms of excitement, enthusiasm, and so on. He wanted to be balanced, which I'm a big fan of, balance. So they made him a ring, and the magic part of the ring were the words, three words in Hebrew, More, it's more in English, gam zu yavor. This too shall pass. And that, that is the nature of life, that this too shall pass. I remember thinking... Communism is here to stay, well, and it certainly has. In it, it certainly has, ironically. <laughs> it, it hasn't in Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria, or or East Germany, which no longer exists. It's part of Germany, but it it does exist in China and North Korea and Cuba, and it does exist on college campuses. I mean, people, uh, and, and go, in the U.S. government, I mean, we have people who are indistinguishable from uh, the communists of, of the Soviet Union in terms of their willingness to use the government to suppress opponents. I mean, we, we are drifting towards a 
a, toward a Sovietification of the United States. But anyway, in, in those countries, I didn't think it was going to disappear in my lifetime. It, it was, it's, and yet it does. And when I talk to Poles, the Bulgarians and others from Eastern Europe, and I mentioned when I was last there or that I was there on the communism, it truly is uh, like, wow, wow, that, that is a, that's another history. It's, it's a long time ago. And here it is, and here I will be visiting, and communism is no longer in these countries. In fact, some of these countries are leading forces for the continuation of Western civilization. When I last spoke in Romania, I don't know, about five years ago, I told them, because somebody raised his hand, after the talk, to ask about Western Europe drifting away and what does that mean for Western civilization? And I said, it's terrible. But maybe you you in Eastern Europe should think you will preserve Western civilization. Don't rely on the United States and Western Europe. Maybe you in Eastern Europe will preserve the West. I still believe that. There's a certain, I think, inferiority complex, but it, it's certain, I mean, not in every arena, but vis-a-vis civilizational achievement, vis-a-vis Western Europe, but Western Europe is committing suicide. Econ- economic suicide, cultural suicide. The greatest force for economic suicide are the Greens, the environmentalists, the fanatics of our age, or among the fanatics of our age. There are, there are quite a number of fanatics. It's very hard to pursue truth. People are not fans of truth. They're fans of their ideology. I have an old riddle. What do you call a religious person who, said, who says the world is coming to an end? I call him a religious fanatic. What do you call a secular person who says the world is coming to an end? An environmentalist. They should be called secular fanatics. And they are. But there's a very big difference between those religious fanatics and the secular fanatics. The religious fanatic has no power. At least the one that I'm talking about in the Western world, the one who says, uh, you know, watches with a sign, the world is coming to an end, has no power. But the secular fanatics are in power. That's that's a very big and important difference. This is the hour having you call in on anything because it's my last hour before my two-week annual listener cruise. You know, one of the highlights uh, of these cruises, by the way, and my trip to Israel, they're separate uh, issues. One of the highlights for me is the lasting friendships that people make. I love putting people together. I I, I love matching people to get married, and I love matching people to have friends. It's one of my almost hobbies. And these cruises and Israel trips are one way of my doing so. Okay, let's see. Uh, Lucas in Hollywood, California. Hello. Yeah, good morning, Dennis. I wanted to get your take on Pride Night and the the invitation, reinvitation of uh, Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. I have commented on it, and I'm happy to do so again. I think people should not go to Dodger games. I think people should treat the Los Angeles Dodgers and people in L.A. the way people have treated Anheuser-Busch. Uh, an atheist, you don't have to be Catholic. If you have to be Catholic to be offended, then there's no hope for the country. That means unless your group is uh, held in contempt and mocked, uh, only your group should react. I... Uh, the, I am completely opposed to the churches taking part in the night to honor churches and, and, and Christianity, whatever they're calling the night. 
I mean, it, it, it's it's so obvious that the churches are being bought off. They should uh, uh, say to the Dodgers, "The hell with you. Uh, we're not we're not having a night to honor that." After you uh, have these people, not only are they participating in Pride Night, they're getting an award. These are men dressed in women's garb like nuns and 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 mocking mocking obviously the church mocking religion have, have you have you seen the hunky jesus contest they have you're kidding me so pull it up i hunky will i jesus. will yep. yeah my question here's my question uh so many dodger fans a, a true true fan base is latino and largely they are Catholic, and I just wonder where this, how this is playing in those parts of the Yes, state. that's a great question, and my suspicion is 80% don't even know what's happening. Who's going to tell them? Univision? The Spanish language media? I'll continue with that in a moment. 1 8 Prager 776. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Dennis Prager, last show before my two-week annual listener cruise. Going to East Europe today after the show. I broadcast at the last minute. <laughs> uh, well, I'm dedicated. So whatever's on your mind, last caller was about the Los Angeles Dodgers honoring, not just having Pride Night, but honoring Men dressed as nuns in a pure mockery of Catholicism and the, and uh, nuns. And so they're having, as a result, they're going to be doing the Christian Faith and Family Day at Dodger Stadium. I don't think Christians should take part in it. The issue is not honoring Christians. The issue is dishonoring Christians. The issue is dishonoring faith. The issue is mockery of the human condition. I don't celebrate men dressed as women. I tolerate it. It's not illegal, but I don't celebrate it. The left is totalitarian. They care what you think, not only how you behave. So if you behave decently that is not enough you must have pride in men dressed as women we're not talking trans we're talking men dressed as women so uh, I think that uh, Christians should not take part in it I don't think I think people should stop going to the ballpark they won't there's a the last caller asked about the the large Latino support for the Dodgers, and most of them are Catholic, and my suspicion is they have no idea that this is happening. I don't think the Spanish language media even report on the on the mockery of the nuns. Most Spanish language media are identical to CNN and MSNBC, one of the problems in our society. All right, what's on your mind here? <laughs> Should the Republicans cheat to win the next election? Oh, my God. That's fascinating. Republicans don't have to cheat to win the next election. They have to ensure that the elections are honest. That's, uh, I don't advocate cheating in the election. I advocate making sure that cheating doesn't take place. All right, let's see. St. Michael, Minnesota, and Dennis. Whoa, a relatively young Dennis. Hello. Hi, Dennis. Nice to talk to you. Thank you. Why would your parents name you Dennis? I have no idea. There's nobody in my family named Dennis. Hmm. <laughs> i got to ask my dad that one. I've forgotten. That's cute. All right, go ahead. Well, my son uh, started refing youth hockey at 12 years old. He's now 14. He's refed about, I don't know, almost uh, 300 hockey games. 
but you, you talk about language and everything, and I seen him do something last year, last weekend that he was at a tournament, not the regular season, and he's at the blue line waiting for his partner to drop at the circle uh, by the net, and all of a sudden he blows the whistle, and everybody looks over, and they didn't know what was going on, and he turns around and he gives the coach a bench minor penalty, and I found out later after the game, obviously I didn't know what happened, but he said he was on the blue line, and the coach started just verbally abusing one of the 13-year-olds on the bench. And Owen, my son, just said, and all of a sudden he starts swearing at him, and then he started using the F-bomb. And my, as a ref, that's one, he doesn't tolerate the F-bomb, and he kicks you out of the game. He turns around, and he only gave him the bench minor, but it was, I've never seen him give a penalty before to a coach for abusing one of his own kids. So on the bench is that actu- Wait, is that legal in, in, uh, is in the NHL? I don't think that could happen. I don't no, think, in yeah, the you, NHL, you can't get a penalty for if you got a penalty for cursing, there would be nobody on the ice. Right. He draws the line at the F bomb, and then the same weekend, another thirteen-year-old at a different game got a cross-check penalty. It was everybody saw it, and the kid starts swearing at her mad when he goes going to the penalty box, and all of a sudden he starts to F bomb him, and Owen said, "Stop it now! Or you're, you're gonna, I'm gonna penalize you." And he kept doing it, and all of a sudden he blows his whistle, does the game misconduct penalty, and kicks him out of the game. And the coach is like, what happened? And Owen starts to tell you what he was swearing. What was he saying? F this, F you, F your mom. Okay, I get it. I get it. And then the coach didn't even complain and kicked one off the ice. Well, you know, I, I'm against public cursing. I'm not a fan of constant private cursing, but private and public matter. Right, I mean, private urination is not the same as public urination, so uh, it should be obvious public and private are different. But I, I've always been opposed. I think it was it was the beginning of the decline of the United States when people started cursing publicly. It was just not done in American history. It started again like almost everything rotten in the 60s and 70s when a generation arose my generation the baby boomers who believed that they were wiser than all human beings who ever lived before them don't trust anyone over 30 they they acknowledge that we know better the arrogance of the baby boomers and i i blame the parents the so-called greatest generation who were great in many ways they they were uh, uh let, let us say unprepared to be effective parents by and large they produced the most arrogant generation in American history, and that is my generation, not every member of my generation, obviously. But that's what they produced, and the arrogance has not changed. The, whole, the, left, the left is characterized by arrogance and ingratitude, two of the ugliest traits in, in the human condition. And the arrogance is we know better than every generation that preceded us. That is the reason, that the, to think that the average left, not the average, all leftists have contempt for George Washington, James Madison, Thomas Jefferson. I mean, it is, it is mind-boggling. These giants versus these midgets. It, it's really quite something, the arrogance. We know better how to make a good society than the founders of the freest society ever created. Yes, it had slavery. Every society had slavery. So it doesn't say anything about America that distinguishes it. What distinguishes America is its freedom, not its slavery. That's far too uh, complex a concept for a Yale graduate. And I mean that literally. I think it is. I think it's too sophisticated a, a proposition for the average graduate of Yale. And the ingratitude, of course, is part of the arrogance so that uh, that is the mess in which we find ourselves we continue well everybody I welcome you back to the Dennis Prager show last one for two weeks as I go by listener cruise 
beginning tomorrow. You will enjoy my show immensely when I am not here, however. A truly magnificent series of people will be sitting in. And I will have a lot to say, obviously, upon return. And look forward to the trip, look forward to returning. And that is what it is. Okay, everybody, one eight Prager 776 since it's my final hour for two weeks, I am just opening it up as if it were a Friday third hour. Frisco, Texas. Randy, hello. Well, Mr. Prager, it is a great honor to speak with you. Thank you. Um, I know there are, there are intellectual giants in this world, and watching, seeing, and hearing you talk on a regular basis uh, reminds me of such things as a Gen X raised by a... <laughs> as raised by a boomer that was caught up in the, uh, I forgot what it would be considered, but I guess it's the Jesus movement of her time. Mm -hmm. Um, This is where I, this is where I come from and where I live. (laughs) So the other day you were talking about, you would like your, one of your main goals in life is to have people be good Yep. and that you would be focused on having people be good and that it can do that people, disconnect good and substitute a mediocre, good, great, excellent um, terminology for the word good in in their mind. And as I know and try to get people to understand, the English language, it should be respected, and also you should understand terminology in regards to the history of the word good. So whenever you brought that up, it it took me a while, and it wasn't until late last night whenever I was getting ready to bed to understand what the disconnect is, because uh, as far as I can recall, one point in time when Jesus, they picked up stones to stone Jesus, it's because he said, um, he used the term I am, and if people don't understand, it's the same I am that Moses was told at the burning bush that he should say whenever um, he said, what should I say to Pharaoh, like, what, who shall I say sent me? And whenever they went to pick up stone, whenever they went to stone Jesus, he said, are you stoning me because I am good? And they're like, wait, hold on. Not only did you use I am, but you also used good. And what people don't understand is as a Jew, as a, in the Judeo-Christian term of good, that there's a break between the Jews and the Christians in that word, that Christians normally do not understand the gravitas of the word good and that it can only be, it is a perfection of the word, whereas we see it as a linear, an in, in, in alignment with good, better, best, and that's the disconnect. That's why people see it as mediocre and not mm. the actual... Well, all right, let me explain to everybody what this is about. I, I raised this yesterday at the Ultimate Issues Hour. I, I said in, in a debate with a, a Catholic uh, podcaster, Matt Fred. I said that I am preoccupied with people being good, not saints. And he said, well, we are preoccupied with making people, I don't know if you use the word saint, but making people perfect in the way that God is perfect and so on. And there was a critique in in another Catholic journal of my take on this, saying that I was satisfied with mediocre because all I want is people to be good. So that's the context here. And my contention is that if everyone were good, we wouldn't need saints. If everyone were good, we would be living in a Garden of Eden. There aren't that many good people. There are many nice people. There are not that many good people. It, it is interesting, and I've said this, this is not new, I've said this from the beginning of my, working out my theology in my 20s. God wants us to be good, bores most religious people. They think that is so minimal that they, they demand more, whether it's far more ritual observance or farm or or the saintly thoughts or what have you it's it's fascinating to me that 
God wants us to be good doesn't excite religious people much. In light of all the evil, I don't know what's more exciting. Anyway, that's my take. Yeah, it's too bad he, uh, Sean picked the right variation to introduce you. But it's, uh, it's harpsichord, which you won't fall in love with immediately. Anyway, that's uh, one of my two favorite pieces. Okay, everybody, let me summarize your calls. Please, please, I beg of you. I rarely beg. Don't hang up, because then I don't know what you uh, want to talk about. This has been an open line because it's my last show for two weeks as I go to my listener cruise that I do every year for 25 years I've been doing it. Sam in Denver, what was your lowest point in your life and how did you handle it? Well, I was unhappy till I was 13, relatively. Uh, but lowest point, I would say, was uh, my, my previous divorce. And it was very painful. Well, every divorce is painful. I don't, it's very rare to hear of a non-painful divorce. And struggles my second son has had and now is terrific, but he had years of addiction. Thank God he's alive. Thank God he's well. Thank God he's married. He's, he's terrific. So I've had low points. When I speak about uh, happiness that's why I titled my book, Happiness is a Serious Problem. If I had an easy life, and compared to many, I had had an easy life, but I didn't have a painless life, let's put it that way. Nor did I seek a painless life. I seek a meaningful life. Uh, San Antonio Rick, please address whether you believe the rest of the Old Testament is inspired. Yes, I think it's inspired, but it's not the same as from God. I believe the first five books are divine. The Torah, the first five. Hence my commentary, each volume, is on the first five volumes. Numbers will come out next year, hopefully. Then I'll have one to go, Leviticus. Uh, John in Minneapolis, transgenderism seems to be taking all the oxygen uh, in the room. That's correct. And uh, there's a reason. Because if society establishes that Men are not men and women are not women and can be the other at their own whim. Uh, it, it is the end of civilization as we know it. It, it, it. it is worthy of taking the oxygen out of the room, although it's not the only issue, obviously. Uh, I would love to have taken Chris. He, he, he has wanted to talk about my mother smoking L&M, which is funny. And Elizabeth in uh, Albemarle... North Carolina, about how many Christians are taking a lot of the Jewish observances seriously. We should talk about that. Hey, everybody, you're in great hands while I'm gone. I, I look forward to the cruise, and I also look forward to returning. I'll see you then, and thank you. Dennis Prager here. Thanks for listening to the Daily Dennis Prager Podcast. To hear the entire three hours of my radio show, commercial-free, every single day, become a member of PragerTopia. You'll also get access to 15 years' worth of archives, as well as the daily show prep. Subscribe at PragerTopia.com.